It's been one year since the earthquake and tsunami in Japan and the Fukushima nuclear disaster. What I want to know is how people are coping today. So I'm traveling the east coast from the north down to Fukushima. Rarely has the izakaya been this full. It's a tiny bar in the hills of Minami Sanriku. Today, people have come to listen to Karen Sasaki. The 12 year old tsunami survivor is reading from her diary. She's written about all her experiences since March 11th, the day the tsunami came. I can't write very well, she tells me, but keeping a diary and reading it out loud helps me to get things off my chest, she says. We have to talk about what we've experienced, says Karen's father, Shin. No one else should die because of a tsunami. We need to pass on our experiences from one generation to the next. Maybe it will save lives. March the 11th, 2011. First came the powerful earthquake, then the huge wave, heading straight towards Minami Sanriku. A tsunami is coming. Please flee to higher ground, warns a voice over the loudspeakers. A young worker from the emergency services who would later die in the tsunami herself. The giant wall of water was 20 meters high. It left nothing standing. Karen ran to her school, which stands on a hill. Her father, Shin, managed to climb onto the roof of a department store. <coughs> it was like a dream, he says. There was a huge ship heading towards us. On the other side was a hospital. I saw a patient get washed away with his bed. He cried for help. All night I worried about my wife and children. We didn't find each other until the next day, Karen says. I was overjoyed that we'd all survived. One year on, only foundations remain where houses once stood. Mountains of rubble still tower as high as the original tsunami. Only one-tenth of the rubble has been removed to date. No one wants to take the waste for fear of radioactive contamination. Fukushima is only 150 kilometers away. Shin and Karen take me to their former home. The first time I stood here, I thought, that was our house. Then I searched through the rubble to see if I could find anything of mine, she says. I loved our house. We lived here for 40 years, her father says. But I won't rebuild here. It's too near the water. Maybe back there instead. So what does the future hold from Inami Sanriku? It's hard to find anyone who has an answer. The local authorities are considering building new houses on the hillsides. Only businesses would then be located nearer the water. But nothing has been decided. In the meantime, more and more people are leaving, particularly the younger generation. Last year passed so quickly, Karen says, and there was hardly any progress. I hope we'll soon have a new city and that we'll be safe there. It's now evening in Minami Sanriku. Here in the hills, people feel safe. Karen Sasaki and her family have begun a new life here. But she is determined to keep the memory of what happened alive with her readings. I leave Minami Sanriku and continue on to Kamaishi. The tsunami wreaked devastation here too. Gaping emptiness has replaced a town that was once full of life. An icy wind whistles through empty buildings. I've arranged to meet with divers from the Japanese Coast Guard. Nearly 20,000 people were killed in the tsunami. Over 3,000 of them are still missing. On board the Isuzu, a team of eight divers are preparing for their latest mission to search for bodies. They're all specialized in this kind of work. Kunitera Kurita is one of them. 
There are still many areas that we haven't searched yet, he tells me. I believe we still have a good chance of recovering the missing. In Kamaishi alone, 500 people are still missing. They could well be lying on the seabed, covered by mud and algae. The divers are committed to recovering the dead and returning them to their families to give them a sense of closure. Since the tsunami, Kunitera Kurita and his team have been out repeatedly around the coast of Kamaishi. Of course we take diving equipment, he tells me, but the most important thing is our torches. Without them, we wouldn't be able to find anything. They then descend 17 meters into the blue-green underworld. Often they will spot a body suddenly, caught between sofas, cupboards, or bashed up cars. The dive is itself risky. The underwater wreckage has many sharp edges. There are also powerful currents, and it's cold, just three degrees Celsius. Takeshi Sugiura gets to stay in the warm. He is the captain of the Isuzu. I hope we can find as many of the missing as possible, he tells me, so they can be returned to their families. We will continue for as long as it makes sense. Today the Isuzu is moored securely to the dock, but on the day of the tsunami all the Coast Guard boats headed out to sea, directly towards the wall of water. The men tell me they actually felt safer being out at sea. After about an hour, the divers end their search in the harbor of Kamaishi. We return to the waiting ship. The divers did not find any bodies today. There's so much debris down there, Kunitera Kurita tells me. Loads of cars, but also small things. Today I saw a book, a bag. One by one the divers climb back on board the Isuzu. They need to move quickly. The air is even colder than the sea. The men have brought a photo album back up with them. Pictures of happier times are still recognizable, but now ruined by the sea. We're constantly trying to improve our methods, he says. There are still so many bodies down there. One time we found someone tangled up in a fishing net. We really want to recover the dead. Here in Kamaishi, many families are still waiting for news from the divers. The search is expected to continue for months or even years. I leave the coastal road. As I move further south, another problem becomes more of an issue, the dangers of radiation fallout. I arrive at Koriyama, some 50 kilometers from the Fukushima nuclear plant. Eiko Hashimoto is collecting her daughter, Sayako, from school. She gives a quick wave to her schoolmate and jumps in the car. They don't like to hang around outside these days. I drive my daughter to school every day and fetch her again later. I want her to spend as little time as possible outside, she tells me. I want to live a long life, says Sayako, so we have to take good care. Koriyama is home to some 300,000 people and just an hour's train journey from Tokyo. It was particularly affected by the radioactive cloud from Fukushima. Radiation levels measured at some points have reportedly been as high as 5 or 10 microsieverts an hour. Following the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, people were evacuated due to similar levels. The center of Koriyama would have been evacuated under Chernobyl standards, says Toshio Yanagihara, a lawyer behind a local citizen's initiative. But an evacuation would be too expensive. The authorities have weighed up money and human life and decided to go with the money. The authorities deny such claims, but many here remain unconvinced. 
I pay a visit to a local health center set up especially for children from the Fukushima region. The doctors say they're getting an increasing number of children complaining of tiredness, dizziness and fainting. Many wonder whether this could be the result of radiation. We're concerned that many people may have been exposed to high doses of radiation immediately after March 11th, says Dr. Makoto Yamada. We now need to observe the long-term trend, maybe for the next 20 years. So far, the children of Fukushima have only been officially examined once. One in every three tested positive for cesium. Some children were even found to have tiny knots in their thyroid gland. It's not clear whether they could be the early signs of cancer. The authorities have sought to calm the situation, saying everything is okay. Everything's okay, that's just not true, says Shinichi Kurobe, who previously treated children near Chernobyl. Children and young mothers should leave the Fukushima region immediately. In a few years, we'll see the first cancer cases. Concerned parents in Koryama try to do what they can. Every day, Eiko Hashimoto measures the radiation levels around her house. We no longer open our windows. I don't use the ventilator in the kitchen either, she says, and I haven't hung my washing outside for ages. The unseen threat seems to hang over Koryama like a dark cloud. Many here feel other cities should have been evacuated too. My journey along Japan's northeast coast has come to an end. One thing is clear to me, the country will need a long time to get back to normal.